Good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee in 2024. Uh, before we begin, can I please uh, ask those involved to ensure that their electronic devices are switched to silent. Uh, this morning we have had apologies from Beatrice Wishart and Rhoda Grant and uh, Eleanor Whittam and Colin Beattie will be joining us uh, remotely. Our business today is consideration of affirmative SSI, the Rural Development Continuation of Operation Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulation 2024. And I note uh, the Scottish Government have also issued a correction slip for the explanatory note accompanying the instrument. And this morning I welcome to the meeting Jim Fairley, Minister for Agriculture and Connectivity, and his officials, James Muldoon, Head of Agriculture Support Policy Development Unit, and Lewis Kerr, uh, a lawyer from the Scottish Government. Uh, for background, uh, the committee previously considered this SSI at an earlier meeting but agreed to defer further consideration until today. Uh, since we last heard from the Minister, the committee held a short call for views on the instrument uh, for which we received 19 responses from stakeholders. Uh, and the Minister also wrote to us about the instrument on the 27th of September. I now invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Yeah, good morning, convener. Thank you. Uh, well, clearly, we all know why I'm back here. I hope that we can make some progress today in passing this crucial regulation. So I note the issues raised last time at committee and in the recent committee call for views. And while I appreciate the interest shown here, there are some issues that need to be addressed in order to avoid any further unnecessary confusion. To be clear to the committee and to our stakeholders and to our customers, Extending to 2030, this regulation does not cut across nor replace the published agricultural reform route map. The route map makes clear there will be no cliff edges in support and a phased transition from legacy support into the new four-tier framework. It also states that the Scottish Rural Development Programme, or the SRDP schemes, will continue with no change until at least 2026, with further engagement required on how the support may be delivered from 2027. This regulation is simple and straightforward by design. It is not about making changes to policy, or to outcomes, or to payments. That was never the intent, nor is that what was publicly committed to. All this regulation does is to extend the legal basis for the continued SRDP support at programme level. That means that all support, not just less favoured area support, but also for crofting, agri-environment, forestry and community-led local development, to name a few, if this is not approved and there is no support, there will be no phase transition, there will be only a cliff edge. So to be clear, 2030 does not mean no change, and I reiterate that, it does not mean no change. It does not mean that every scheme will run as is in every year until 2030. What it means is that instead of constant cliff edges and annual visits to Parliament to extend schemes, we will instead be coming back here when there is a change to make or when we bring forward replacement support. The route map sets, this out, this phased, sets out this phased transition. This regulation is a pragmatic approach that provides continued assurance and a backstop. It enables us to focus our collective time and resource on the co-development of new support within the four-tier framework using the powers of the Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Act 2024. As far as ELFAS is concerned, questions have been raised about the lack of payment rate change and about why we have not rebased ELFAS. Now, the Cabinet Secretary has made clear, and I quote, however, to rebase the scheme now would be a costly and resource-intensive exercise that would deliver little in terms of benefit and would detract from work on future replacement. It is right that we focus collective efforts on ensuring that support for constrained areas is the most effective it can be in the new support framework. So that situation has not changed. Now, I have spoken to Peter Kennedy from the NFU LFA Committee yesterday, and he reiterated their position that neither the LFA Committee nor NFU Scotland are calling for rebasing to take place at this point. This has been made abundantly clear in their call for view to responses, in your, view, in your call for views response, which also states their complete support for this regulation. This reasoning also applies to other legacy SRDP support. We can continue to attempt short-term fixes to complex legacy support, or we can focus on the co-development of a future support, but we can't do both. The route map is clear that the LFAS will continue unchanged till at least 2026. Now, I'm sure we're going to discuss call for views later, but there are two quotes I want to highlight to provide a good summary of the situation. This is from NFU Scotland. Issues concerning the current operation of LFAS, such as possible rebasing, are completely separate to this SSI and must not be conflated. And Western Isles Council said 
They are supportive of a continuation of the schemes until other suitable schemes and programmes were implemented. So this regulation is about the continuation of the SRDP support, removing a cliff edge and the underpinning of the route map phase transition, and that is it. Discussions about future changes and the introduction of replacement support are not for this regulation, but for the Agriculture Reform Programme, and those discussions will continue in line with the published route map. But to be blunt, you can't make the changes, improvements, rebase or transition from something that doesn't exist. That is the fundamental issue that we have at stake here. Without this regulation, there is no SRDP support. I hope that today we can provide some assurance to our farmers, crofters and land managers, and I hope we pass this regulation. I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, thank you Minister. Um, yeah, there's certainly uh, plenty of quotes to choose from uh, out of the, the 19 responses that we've had. Uh, I, I think we need to make it clear, I, I don't believe, uh, when I speak for the committee, there's any desire to reach this cliff edge. Uh, that is not uh, something that uh, the committee uh, wants to see, uh, and it's, it's not something that uh, we, would, we would consider uh, uh, happening. But there are real concerns about the lack of proper and broad industry consultation up to now, uh, given that uh, it's quite some time since we left Europe. Um, and whilst the, the NFUSA uh, LFA going on to 2030 uh, it will allow for thorough consideration, there is frustration uh, and impatience building across the agricultural industry, that there doesn't appear to be any, uh, any pace when it comes to replacements for LFAS and, 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 and the schemes. So we are, we are, and certainly I am, uh, concerned about the 2030. And as you know, throughout the Agricultural Bill, there was a focus on the, the, the role of Parliament in scrutinising uh, the sanctuary legislation. So um, the idea that this committee would be put out by having to look at legislation to extend schemes, I think, is, is ill-placed. It's something that, as a committee, uh, we would welcome and not see it as a, a waste of time. Um, so the 2030 deadline is one of the main issues we have and, and why the government are not more ambitious and, and not accelerating uh, the development of plans so that 2030 doesn't have to be mentioned. We could be looking at a, a maybe a, a, a three-year uh, extension to the, the 2024 uh, deadline. I'm going to try to be as, as plain as possible. There is absolutely no desire to try to hoodwink the industry or to play off the industry or to create any division here. We simply need to get this regula regulation in place. And you mentioned Elfast again in the context of this regulation, but it's only one part of it. It's the entire SRDP programme. This allows us to simply put legislation in place that gives us a backstop until 2030. There are going to be numerous SSIs, there are going to be numerous opportunities for us to come back here, and we will disagree on some of the points that we're going to try and do. I have absolutely no doubt about that. This one is purely to, to allow us to get the time and the space to be able to go away, do the work that's required, in conjunction with other stakeholders. And I picked up some of the points in the, in the, the call for views that some people feel as though they are not being listened to. I'll give an absolute commitment that I'll engage with as many people as I possibly can as we go forward and we develop these schemes in order to make sure we get them right. Because that's the most important thing about this, is having a, a, a box that we can put these regulations into that will be co-designed and discussed at full with the industry as much as we possibly can as we go forward. Getting this one done now puts that to bed and we then know we've got a backstop until 2030. That's there. Everything else is going to come in behind that. So as we develop them and we grow them, I'd much rather be spending time looking at those things and discussing them with the industry as keep them coming back with this regulation, which needs to be repeated. There's no point in doing it. It's not necessary. It's just a waste of time. So therefore, I'd rather we were focusing on the things that are going to get changed. And therefore, that's why I'd really like to get this one done so we can move on to the next stage of it. 
Yeah, I'd absolutely refute the fact that it's a waste of time because it gives Parliament the opportunity to scrutinise what the governments are doing. So having a, having a deadline shorter than 2030 allows this committee to get you and your officials in front of us to properly scrutinise, whereas when we pass this, there is no opportunity for us to, on a legal basis, bring, bring you back okay, uh, you know, to, to scrutinise it. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. I do no, no, continue. I, 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 <laughs> We will be coming back with every single piece of legislation that we develop as we go along so that this committee can scrutinise it. I have given an open commitment that we will come back and talk to this committee. We will talk to stakeholders. The entire point of this is get this bit done because it is merely the mechanism to allow us to make the payments. It is not about what the payments look like. It is not the size of them. It is not the shape of them. It has got nothing to do with what these payments are. It is entirely about the machine that allows us to say, OK, we have an SRDP payment on a CAF scheme or a SUS scheme or whatever it is, and we can say, right, that can go into that bit of legislation and then we can start making payments out of it. it it's just to give us the backstop so that we can get on and do the other stuff. If it's, if it's a supplementary, this because we're going to bring in Emma Harper, but a short supplementary. Just a on. very short supplementary, if I may, Emma. Um, this rural support... support um, needs to be delivered from January the 1st. There's no cliff edge. There's absolutely no cliff edge. We have an opportunity to scrutinise this properly. We've had 18 people come to us with um, their views on this. There's no cliff edge, Minister. You're making it up. And um, you're, not, you're making up the, the term cliff edge. There's no, oh, no. cliff edge. <laughs> we have an opportunity oh, to come back in November to this committee with um, a possibly a redrafted SSI that would address the concerns of the stakeholders that have written to us in the calls for view over the last week. I, I refute that. I refute that and I will be more than happy to continue the conversations with the, the people who have written in the, the call for views. I've got a very good working relationship with the vast majority of them. I've offered to meet most of them. Um, so that is not... The, the position that we are in. We want to get this done in order to give us a backstop so that we can get on with making the regulations that are required for the industry, which is what the industry are looking for. But please could I get confirmation that it's 40 days before the January the 1st deadline that you have to get this done, which doesn't mean we have to get it through today. Is it 40 days? Uh, the rule is 40 days for laying, yeah. So the rule is 40 days for later, so yes, that's a fact. But this gets it so done you'll take and back allows us... the fact us... that you refuted what I just said? No, I refute the fact that you say I'm making it up. You're making up the term cliff edge. It's okay, not a I, cliff I'm, edge. I'm not going to get into semantics with okay. the member. I'm asking the committee to pass this regulation so that we can get on and do the serious work of getting the support systems in place that the farming community want. Thank you. Emma Harper. Thanks, convener. Good morning, Minister and officials. Thanks for being here. Um, just what you're saying about this backstop until 2030, it doesn't mean that 2030 is when people will start doing the work and making the changes that are needed with all the different schemes like you're discussing. It's, yeah. it's not just Elfast, it's other issues around suckle calves and, and, uh, and there's, there are a lot of schemes that need to be developed and my understanding is that resources are already driving those changes forward so um, and we have had a lot of evidence in the last fortnight from different people which just shows that you know there is a level of concern so uh, and in our evidence it says that you, you gave assurances that it does not necessarily mean that the schemes will go until 2030 so just to reassure the committee that should we approve this SSI today that obviously it doesn't mean that 2030 will be the like that is a backstop date but it doesn't mean nothing else will happen before that it's purely a backstop date and I can guarantee that things will be changing before that I do not I absolutely do not minimize the the responses that you got in your calls for views um, but what I would say to that is that there has been a general misunderstanding of what this SSI does it's got and I keep reiterating it, it doesn't change anything other than giving us the mechanism to be able to make payments as the schemes change as we go along. Convener, I, yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't not, think they're you're not agreeing with me. Yeah, I don't think there's a misunderstanding about what the SSI does. Um, there, there are absolutely no uh, misunderstanding within the committee members uh, and from 
The responses we got, there is no misunderstanding. We, we understand exactly what the SSI does, and it's a payment mechanism. That's all it is. What the concern is, that uh, is how the 2030 date fits in with the route map, because there's no ambition with a 2030 deadline. I know you're saying it allows flexibility, but it doesn't fit in with your route map, because 2030 is way beyond when you need to deliver. Um, there are real concerns about the pace on of how uh, cross-industry discussions will take place uh, and how regarding uh, retargeting and rebasing. Um, so that there's a whole range of different concerns that this SSI raises. Um, but there's no misunderstanding about what the tool, uh, the instrument does itself. Uh, we make, make that absolutely clear. Okay. In terms of the point that you've just made uh, around um, the, the consultation with industry, that's ongoing as we speak. Th those conversations are happening with farmers right across the country, through the AREOB, through NFUS, through the Scottish Na the, the National Sheep Association. But these, but can I these stop conversations are happening on a regular basis that allows officials to bring forward the advice and the conversations that were then put to ministers. That's how the process works. You, you, you mentioned Ariob, and, you, and you, you mentioned Ariob a number of times last week as well. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't be the platform for this type of consultation because. But it's not the only one. You know, but it's, it's, we, we hear this all the time. I've also, again, in, in some of the correspondence we get there, and you know, particularly the, the, the message we got from the Institute of Auctioneers and Appraisals, Scottish Land and Estate, Scottish Tenant Farmers Association, the National Sheep Association, Scottish Beef Association, and National Beef Association, are all in the dark about how the, con, uh, the consultation, specifically around um, you know retargeting and rebasing. Um, because they, they feel they have not been consulted and have concerns that, you know, the, uh, in effect, the, uh, the, the terms of reference for Ariob need to be reviewed and, and their role in all this. Uh, and also, uh, you have often referred to the NFUS. They are only one membership organisation. So there is concern that the consultations and the co-development is not happening at this stage. Well, I have read through all of the, the calls for views Everybody agrees that the SSI should go through. Everybody's asking for more consultation, and I actually accept that. So I particularly read Scottish Land and Estates. I'll give an, an invitation to them now. Come and speak to me, and we'll have a conversation about this. Um, all the other people who have written in all accept that this SSI needs to pass to allow us to have those conversations. And I will give an absolute commitment here and now that I'll speak to every organisation that wants to speak to me that's relevant to this, and we'll have those conversations. There is nothing to try to hide or to try to, to delay. Um, I can't give any more than that commitment, can we? OK. Um, Rachel Hamilton. Uh, Minister, who determines the membership of Ariob and what criteria is used to decide that membership? I don't know. I wasn't part of that process. OK. Um, are the Ariob members um, representatives as individuals or are they representatives of their organisations? My understanding is they are representatives as individuals. OK. So when you say that, for example, the NFUS agree with this SSI and you, you refer that to Ariob, you mean Martin Kennedy agrees? No, I mean the NFUS as an organisation have come to me and told me this. I've spoken directly to the convener of the LFAS committee. I spoke to him directly and he said there has been a misrepresentation of the NFU's position on the, uh, the acceptance of this SSI. So it's not just Martin Kennedy, it's people within the organisation who, who talk to the government on a regular basis. So you're saying that it's all to do with co-development yep. and that you will be happy to speak to further groups or organisations, mm -hmm. including the 18 who have um, responded to this SSI um, call for views. Will the uh, co-design process in that case be improved and will the membership of Ariob be widened? to reflect the concerns that people have had? I don't cheer the area of that would be a question for the Cabinet Secretary. But in terms of the co-design being improved, I think we've got a very good co-design uh, organisation already. Because, it's, yes, you're right, I have mentioned the area on a number of occasions, and I refer to NFU. So let me broaden that out. Our officials are in regular dialogue with farmers right across the country. I'm going over to Argyll and Butte very shortly. I don't know what the dates are. I was on the islands over the summer 
relating, uh, meeting up with farmers. I was meeting up with crofters. I will be travelling to the islands later on this year or early next year, speaking to crofters. So the kind of ongoing dialogue might not be seen, it might not be visible. We might not be taking photographs about it, but it's happening on a regular basis. So all I can give you is this assurance that there is nobody more determined to make sure that this works than me. And I'm going to work my damnedest to make sure that we get a system that the farming community say, yeah, we can buy into that and that works for us. OK, the committee has written to the Cabinet Secretary to ask if they can have an observer on the Ariob because we, as a committee, the frustration that we have is that we are in the dark um, and that we cannot understand what feedback you're getting from the area, Ariob. And a lot of the criticism around the way that this SSI has been laid without, con without new consultation and obviously um, relating to a 2009 payment um, has, has accumulated in this, this situation where you know, committee members are frustrated as well. So it would be helpful if we understood what feedback the Cabinet Secretary was getting. And um, obviously you've been discharged to deliver um, and be in front of us today, today but and, and also argue that the ARIOB is part of the co-development um, co process and the engagement process, but then you don't have responsibility for anything to do with the ARIOB. So you can see our frustration. Well, I sit on the ARIOB, but oh. the Cabinet Secretary, co she co-chairs it with Martin Kennedy. And you asked me about the makeup of the Ariob, and I don't know how the makeup of the Ariob was created because I wasn't there. It was set up three years ago or two and a half years ago. So, as far as the letter that you're talking about, I haven't heard about that. I haven't seen that. I have no idea if that has been delivered to officials. Okay. Um, I've got other questions, but maybe other what, members want to come Yeah, can I bring in Ariane Rogers indicated earlier? I'll bring it back in. Thanks, Convener. Um, so, without rehashing things that already, we've already kind of brought up, I just want, so from my understanding, what's happened is we've got this SSI that's required for continuing the payments on the SRDP, but what that's kind of flagged up and brought to light is this issue around the rebasing of the LFAS. Yep. So, that's been a great opportunity because we see that people are concerned about that LFAS piece. Um, what I understand from reading um, the notes that we've got here is <coughs> that um, in the policy note is that we've got the SRDP um, and um, you've, you've put in this kind of reporting to 2030 because there's an, the rural support plan is coming in. And the rural support plan um, it says in our notes here, uh, the policy note, that um, it's extended to 2030 as reporting of legacy cap schemes, which are all the things we're talking about, LFAS, AICS, uh, forestry grant scheme, etc., cetera, uh, are a requirement of rural support plan reporting in the ARC Act. So you're going to... The, so the, there's, there's no need to, in, in a way, or, I don't know, under SRDP to report because the reporting is going to fit in under the rural support plan. So is the SRDP on a parallel with the rural support plan or does it get tucked inside it and then continue reporting in that way? Right, okay, that's a technical question. I know, but, that, but I think that's part of what's going on here is, is right. that there's this feeling like, oh, 2030, we're not going to hear any reporting, but the rural support plan, it says in the policy note, will require that legacy schemes are reported on. Yes, I'm going to let James answer that. Yeah, so the first rural support plan will be a plan noting that transition from the legacy schemes to the future four-tier support model. So we will, as legacy schemes exist through that reporting period, they will still be reported on. But that's where the route map, route map matters on this. So the route map has that's, LFAS continuing. That's this. That, is that, yes. Um, so that has LFAS, for example, continuing to at least 26. Yeah. So that will feature on the first rural support plan until it is replaced um, as ministers have committed by a new a, a complete replacement scheme for LFA stroke ANC type support, um, which will be in tier two of the future support model. Okay, um, I, I think that's helpful to understand. So there will be reporting, it's just that you've got to do a technical thing which allows things to move forward. It's, I feel like we need some diagrams, maybe that would yeah. be helpful. Um, but I do think that one of the things that has, uh, so 
Um, so when does the first rural support plan come in? When will we see that? The intention is for that to be laid at Parliament in 25. Okay. And, and the kind, uh, can you say what the kind of um, reporting package will be that comes with it? Or is that too... No, no, I, I, th I, think, I think I can refer back to the, um, the skeleton document that was shared with committee by the Cabinet Secretary um, through stage three of the bill process, which shows the overview of the monitoring and evaluation. Um, so the outcome level related to the bill outcomes and then featuring down through the sub output levels of that so that that's within that skeleton that was provided okay i definitely think we need some diagrams as we go forward with these things um okay but the other thing that got flagged up is this issue around lfas and rebasing and it, as you pointed out james the route map talks about that going on um, until 2026 and then in 2027 engagement is required with farmers crofters on how this type of support will be delivered from 2027 so um, are you going to wait until that point in time to start addressing this or maybe because of this issue that's kind of kind of raised it up maybe is it is it time to kind of bring it a bit further forward in your schedule because it does seem like people are very concerned about it so naturally the pace of change will be in question for, for ministers, but to assure um, officials are aware of the issues raised, not just in this call to evidence, but in regular ongoing discussion that we have with multiple stakeholders on this, um, and, and, and thoughts uh, are ongoing as to what the most effective form of LFA stroke ANC support would be ahead. Those okay. kind of conversations are already happening. Okay. Just coming back to the commitment to co-design, um, and we talk a lot about Ariob, but also in our notes here, it talks about um, the government refers to its commitment to co-design um, of those new schemes, which will continue to engage with stakeholders through mechanisms, including Ariob, but also it says wider ag agricultural refor reform program um, and during the passage of the second of the legislation. Can you explain to us so that we understand a bit more what is the agricultural reform program or how are you engaging with people through that there are multiple is that what you kind yes, of said there are, yeah. there are multiple stakeholders you you um you link i think they've put one of the call for views in so everyone who has got a vested interest in what it is that we're trying to deliver are part of these conversations um and as i say if the the if there is concern around the area i'm more than happy to have conversations but, out with and beyond the AREOB. Yeah, I'm just the, wondering what, what it says in the notes here, wider agricultural reform programme. So, so there's a programme, and that's how you, you use that programme to engage yes. with wider stakeholders. Yes. So it would be quite good to understand and maybe get that unpacked for us a bit, maybe in writing, like who are you engaging with through that programme? Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all my questions. Um, yeah, thanks, convener. Just before I move to Emma Harper, just uh, some clarification. Um, what detail is there on the route map beyond 2027? At the moment, there's none, I don't think. Uh, on the route map at the moment, up until 2027, we've got the launch of elective complementary uh, schemes and a freshen of the BPS into the base. And then it goes up to 2030, where we've got various targets for peatland restoration, etc. Okay, so effectively, despite this being extended to 2030, there is no detail on what happens on the route map beyond no, the 2027. Route map moment, no. Okay, I need to have that on the record. Emma Harper. Thanks, convener. It just, you know, we, we might have strayed away a wee bit from the technical aspects that this SSI is supposed to achieve. Mm -hmm. And it seems that because there's been a lot of discussion about rebasing, retargeting, however we want to describe it, it and co-design, I think part of what needs to happen is promoting trust and engagement and including with young farmers, new entrants, our next generation farmers. That seems to be something that um, is coming out of, of this. But I want to just bring it back to we're supposed to be approving this uh, statutory instrument so that payments can continue it's a technical instrument is that's what i'm trying to that's my understanding yes that's correct okay thanks emma roddick thanks convener um, minister i wonder if you could be very specific about what the impact would be if this ssi is not passed today if it's not passed and we don't get it passed then it means that there'll be no payments made from 2025 onwards okay. there's no 
There's no legal room mechanism to do so. Days. There's, there's no legal mechanism to do so if the SSI doesn't pass. Okay, thank you. But make it clear that it only has to be made 40, 40 days before the 1st of January. Yes. It doesn't have to be today. Yeah, okay. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Okay, just on a supplemental to uh, detail beyond 2027, which was um, Finlay Carson's question, um, with the absence of that detail, um, stakeholders have said it's going to be difficult uh, to make decisions um, on the continuation of LFAS without a clear understanding of that um, wider change in farm funding. It also um, speaks to the sort of issues that uh, the government may have with the transition that farmers are trying to make to um, meet nature and climate goals. What is your response to that? There is ongoing work on all aspects of what the programme is going to look like. I come back to the point that this SSI doesn't touch any of that. This SSI only allows us to put the mechanisms in place to continue to make payments. We've already been through all of the other things that are going to be happening. We've talked about the aches, we've talked about the, the beef scheme, we've talked about all the things that are coming and changing, all of which have been in discussion with the farming community and the wider community in order to deliver it. And these will accelerate as we go through the process. Uh, there will be other things will be added. We'll have further negotiations. We'll disagree about stuff. We'll change stuff because that's the process that we're in. It's to redesign a completely new system while we try to make sure we've got the stability of the current system in place. Okay, so why did you not consult on this SSI if it reflected stocking levels in 2009? The, the, again, this SSI has got nothing to do with stocking levels of 2009. This SSI is entirely about creating the mechanism to allow us to continue to make payments. If we want to talk about stocking levels in 2009, those discussions will be had. If we want to talk about rebasing, those discussions will be had. All the other implementation of policy that is coming is still in the mix. We're, I've just confirmed to Ariane Burgess that we're having the conversations right now about what future ELFA support looks like, how that's going to shape up, and that has been done in conjunction with the farming community and wider stakeholders. But you didn't ask, answer why it wasn't consulted on um, and was the, the consultations were relied on from 2018, which was based on stocking levels of 2009? Because I reiterate, this SSI has got absolutely nothing to do with the funding levels or the policy int intention of what we did back then. This is purely to allow us the mechanism to continue to make payments. Okay. So how has, in wider terms, ELFAS addressed declining stock numbers? How has ELFAS... Address declining, address declining stock, stock numbers. Yeah. Um, it hasn't. No. And there is, a, there is definitely a, a call for changes, mm. and we're wide open to hearing those call for changes. So th that goes back to the point I've just made to you, is that those conversations are ongoing, they're happening now, and I'd be far happier spending time talking to the stakeholders, discussing how we're going to make that system work. And I give the same commitment as I gave at the start of this process. There is nobody more committed than me to making sure that we have got a farming system that keeps people in the countryside, keeps our livestock sector at a critical mass to allow us to continue to make sure we've got a world beating sector that we currently have and I want to do everything I can to protect it. I, I agree with you on that point. But if the conversations that you have just said that you have been having about changing these payments and are ongoing, why have so many stakeholders expressed concern? Because I think they're confused about what this SSI is about. You're saying that the stakeholders are confused? Yes. That they're conflating this SSI as a mechanism for delivery as being a method of changing the policy and the policy intent, and it's not. They're two different things. There were previous assurances that the legacy schemes, like ELFAS, um, would begin from 2027. The, even the first former First Minister at the NFUS AGM said that, Humza Yusuf. What is your opinion on why legacy schemes like LFAS are now being kicked down the line to 2030? In terms of the Because I, I dispute the fact that you're saying that 
current legacy schemes are getting kicked down the road to 2030. I've just told you that we're having conversations now about what LFAS will look like as we go forward. OK, so that brings me back to the absolute crux of the problem here. Do you regret listening to advice that suggested that this SSI, for the reasons that you have given, um, should have gone to 2030? Why didn't you just say, look, it doesn't seem sensible. Let's just bring it to 2027. Stakeholders are expected to deliver the transition that we are asking them to do in climate change and nature goals, and we can give them certainty. Minister, I think this is just a mistake, isn't it? No. Right. Ariane. Um, just on the, um, the, the 40 days, we've got until 40 days before the 1st of January if we didn't pass the SSI today. But if we did pass it today, does that mean that you could get on with putting... I mean, are you stopped from kind of getting on with things if we... I think we've got until like the 22nd of November or something. If we wanted to delay and, and take some more evidence and do some, get some more understanding, does that halt you? Does that create a barrier from moving forward? Or, or would you be able to move forward and get sort of more systems in place for making sure that on the 1st of January things roll out smoothly? We would have to continue to do the work. But time is always running out. Time is the biggest enemy that I have mm. and my officials have right now, is time is making sure that we are actually spending the time doing the things we need to do. If you look at my inbox right now, you're going to see a thousand different people all wanting to come and meet me and talk to me about various different things. And it is a very difficult process of saying, no, we don't have time to do that, don't have time to do that, don't have time to do that, when I know that these things are important to the people that are writing to me. So I never turn away a meeting um, easily on the basis that this is important and they want to talk about this and is there something that we can do. So all the time that we are doing this, we're not doing something else. Mm -hmm. So resource-wise, from my point of view, yes, I would rather get this done so that we can move on and get on to other stuff. And, and could you just give us an indication of what other things could, you could be getting on with? I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> meeting people, but you know, specific <clears throat> chunks of work that might be coming our way or something like that? Uh, off the top of my head, I, 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 no, I can't. I, I can tell you that I have got a an inbox that is sitting there screaming at me saying we need responses to these, these, these and these um, because the time that we have is very, very limited mm. despite the fact that we might, might work seven days a week but there is just huge demands on everybody's time so therefore if we get this done it allows us to think about other things. Okay, thanks. Um, I think, you know, in summary, from my, my position, uh, one of the, the main issues here, or if not the main issue, is extension of, of the deadline to 2030. And uh, whilst the, the argument can be made, it gives some certainty, it's not the sort of certainty the industry needs. It's, uh, it, you know, in fact, it doesn't send the message that we want to get this job done. Would, would, um, given that there is time for the instrument to be uh, laid again in front of this committee, uh, and approved prior to the 1st of January. That's quite clear, because uh, it's a 40-day process. Uh, would you be minded to withdraw the instrument and relay it with an extension uh, to 2027, which is all the clarity we've got at the moment in regards to the route map, but would send the right message that the government is serious about uh, building the new schemes, about the code design, whatever, and not effectively by extend it to 2030, potentially kicking into the long grass. It's, it's not a big ask. It won't affect payments. Um, but what it will allow is uh, the, the industry to see that you are serious about putting these new schemes in place. So it will be a simple uh, withdraw the, the instrument and relay with an extension to 2027 as opposed to 2030. That would make uh, a lot of difference in, in my view when you read the, the, the consultation responses that we've had. I'm given an absolute commitment to the industry that I am working as hard as I possibly can and will continue to do to make sure that we deliver the schemes that they want. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the 2030 date is set. That needs to be the position that we're in. I want to have that backstop. So no, I'm not minded to relay the, the SSI again. I'd like you to 
pass it today is to allow us to get on with the work of actually delivering the processes that we need to get delivered. Yeah, but you've just said there, there's no delay in the, the work that you need to do, uh, and there's no desire for this committee to, 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 to see that cliff edge being realised. But what would be the issue, practically, what is the issue with extending it to 2027 as opposed to 2030? The issue is that we've set the, the regulation to 2030 to give us a backstop, and that's what I'm asking this committee to do, and it's entirely up to the committee's decision whether they go with that or not. Yeah, but I've already I've... given the commitments that I've given to the, to, the, to the industry. I will do all the work that I possibly can. I get, I've given them that, commit, that commitment. I've given this committee that commitment. We've set the regulation to 2030. I do not intend to come back and relay it unless this committee vote, decides to vote it down. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm asking is, what is the downside <coughs> of only extending to 27? What, what are the negative impacts? What, what is preventing you from extending to 20, 27 rather than 2030? Because we've taken a view that we are taking the backstop in order to be able to ensure that if there are unseen circumstances that come along, then we've got some uh, comfort and backstop to make sure that those payments get made till 2030. But you, you could come back to the committee with... I could come back to the committee every if, week, if and you could call me back to the committee every week, but I would rather get on and do the work that allows us to deliver the schemes that we want to deliver. OK. Any other comments? Rachel Hamilton. Yeah, I think, um, I think a number of the stakeholders make a really good point about... Um, the access to the schemes, because some of the farmers that have changed um, and developed, um, actually fixing this sooner and giving them that confidence, as the convener talked about, would allow them to get the access to the funding that they're entitled to, because currently there's been no impact study on whether there are a number of people who have changed um, their business can get access to the SRDB schemes. And I think that is really important. And I appreciate you seem dogmatic about this, but we've done this before. We did this with the Clyde Cobb box. The government went back twice and, and relayed an SSI. It's not a big deal. And it doesn't mean to say that, you know, um, that, you know, we're, we're criticising the government. It just means to say that we're doing our job properly. It means to say that this committee has looked really carefully at this. We've considered the views of the stakeholders. We have come to a point where we're asking you very kindly to look at it, reconsider, not be sort of, you know, stuck in the mud about it, and come back. We can look at this mid-November, and it will still be passed and it will not have any impact on delivering payments. And I'm asking you very nicely, Minister. OK, and I'll respond very nicely and kind, Rachel Hamilton. Um, I take on, on board a lot of the points that you're making about people getting access to payments. I absolutely share those concerns. Um, they are valid concerns, and they are concerns that I would very much like us to address. However, we're at the point just now where I, I, I would very much like to get this SSI passed to allow us to go and carry out the kind of work that you're talking about. I want to be spending my time dealing with that rather than coming back again and dealing with this. I'm asking the committee to pass this SSI to give us the mechanism and the, su the surety up until 2030 that the machine is in place to allow us to make the payments that we want to be making, taking on board all the points that you've made, because I absolutely agree with you, there are things that I would really like to get changed, but we can't do that until we've got the mechanism in place. So I'd very kindly ask the committee to clear this SSI and allow us to go on with the work of doing so. And I appreciate that response, Minister. Um, it would be my preference for us to be able to have stakeholders who actually come and explain to us why, the, why um, this um, payment schedule is, um, need, needs to come forward so that they can actually get the confidence and they can be, um, you know, looking ahead. You know. Minister, because you've, ha you've, you've looked after sheep on the hill before yourself, and you know that people need certainty, and they need to have a vision in front of them. And if they're being asked to do the things that the government are asking them in ter terms of nature restoration and climate change goals, they absolutely need to have this. And it's just, it's just this ridiculous date that has got no thought about it and doesn't give this committee confidence. We could have confidence if you change the date or if you pause this and you would still have time to pass it with 40 days. OK, I'm, I'm inclined to disagree. I'm not going to pause it. I'm not going to change the date. I would ask the, the committee to pass the SSI 
and all the commitments that I have given in this session and the previous session stand. I will work as hard as I can to make sure the policies that we bring forward are policies that work for the stakeholders and the people that we are going to ask them to actually implement it. Hey, Ariane. Convener, I just, I, want, I just want to put on record that based on what I've read in the, um, our call for views and people's perspectives, um, the discussion that we've been having with the Minister and the fact that this SSI is a, is, a, is a technical SSI, the fact that the Rural Support Plan will require that reporting, the fact that there are going to be uh, various schemes transitioning and changing. Um, I want to put on record that I don't have a problem with this SSI and I would like to see it uh, passed today. Any other comments? No. Um, we will now, uh, that uh, concludes agenda item one. We now move on to the formal consideration of the moment, uh, motion to approve the instrument. The Minister to speak to and move motion S6M 14345. Uh, moved, convener. Does any member wish to debate the motion? Rachel Hamilton. Um, from what I've heard, convener, um, I'm still not convinced um, that, that this SSI has been um, brought forward with consideration. I still have severe concerns that there was no consultation. Um, it, and it was based on the 2018 consultation responses. Times have changed since then. We're now in 2024. As a committee, we undertook to take the responsibility to reach out to stakeholders. We did that. We did a call for views. We got an unprecedented amount of responses in one week. Um, we got 18 responses. Um, what I read in my view, was concerning because it doesn't give farmers confidence that they can um, look to what the government expect of them in terms of a transition towards those net zero targets. Um, and I would recommend that we, we withdraw. I know that um, I will probably lose this vote, but as a responsible member of this committee, um, I don't think it has set a very good precedent for all the other instruments that are going to be laid and come before this committee if this is the way the government have looked in an intransigent um, and, and stuck, in the, stuck in the mud way where they actually are not even listening to the, to the stakeholders or this committee. And I, I, I'm very regretful about this. Emma Harper. Thanks, Convener. Just to quickly put on record that my understanding is that this is a technical statutory instrument. I hear what Rachel Hamilton is saying about uh, the wider issue of highlighting that the, the, um, the amount of people that submitted to this statutory instrument, it, it shows that as co-design of the policy moves forward, there needs to be work to promote trust and engage with the rural agricultural New, new farmers, new entrants, and all of that. So I think, you know, again, given that this is a, a, a technical instrument, it has highlighted and uncovered wider work that uh, we need to be sensitive to when engaging with stakeholders. Emma Roddick. Thank you, convener. Um, I do want to be clear that I'm disappointed in the approach here because I do feel that we haven't had clarity on the reason for the SSI lasting until 2030. And that is a point that many witnesses have raised with us. And it would probably have been easier for members of this committee to consider those views and take them forward if conversations about the SSI had happened further in advance. Um, and if the timescales had been shorter, say 2027, then the option would always have been there for the minister to come back and discuss again with us if that had to be extended. Um, I don't feel that I can vote to defer this SSI again because the Minister has been clear that payments may not then be made to farmers, um, but I feel that that's not a position that the committee should be put in and it's a regret that we've not been able to discuss it more openly. Thank you. Uh, Eleanor Whittam. 
Thank you, Convener, and thank you to the Minister for coming along this morning. Um, I think I would like to put on record that I do think that every member of this committee is a responsible member of the committee. Um, I think notwithstanding that, um, I, I do think that um, the, the worry that I would have in terms of the fact that 80% of Scotland um, is a less favourable area, um, I would have concerns about those payments not being made given the short time frame. But I do echo some of the sentiments that have just been expressed by my colleague Emma Roddick. I do think that going forward, um, having more of a time frame would be more beneficial for us to be able to actually delve a little bit deeper into it. Um, just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Ariane Burgess. Thanks, Convener. In a way, I, I've already put it on record before we got into the debate section, but I, I, th I think also something that we're going to need is um, clarity around, and I did say diagrams earlier, but I think that might help, how, where we're currently in the situation we're currently in with the SRDP um, and moving into the rural support plan, there needs to be clarity around that because I think that's maybe been part of the missing piece is the, the not picking up that there will be reporting, that there will be things going on under that rural support plan. And it's been flagged up to me that clearly the sector and people involved in the sector are not understanding that fully, even though there is information out there. I did have a look at the websites on it and it is not actually necessarily easy to pick up and understand it all. So maybe some more work needs to be done in that area. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm very disappointed that the Minister won't consider uh, withdrawing this amendment, uh, this uh, instrument, and considering uh, reducing the date from 2030 to 2027, 20, given that uh, the majority of the responses uh, we've had as, uh, on the, the res, as a result of the call for views suggested that that, that was the main issue here. Um, I, I think that there is one respondent, former NFUS president, who, um, and I'll, I'll quote because I think this says it all, while I recognise that flexibility is to be appreciated as the new policy is developed, it also indicates that there is little confidence in concluding this soon. As a farmer, it creates many dilemmas in making business decisions, not knowing what policy will be in place and at what time. Um, the, the request to consider a, a date of 2027 I don't think is unreasonable, given that we don't have any indication of what the route map will look after 2027. Um, and the previous uh, to this session, um, despite asking the Minister, there has been no clear reason why a deadline of 2027 couldn't be adopted. And I'm sure if that was the case, this instrument would have passed uh, without debate um, and it would have sent the message to the industry that there was uh, a, a desire to, to keep the pace up and deliver the necessary change. Uh, that the industry needs to see. So I am disappointed that there does seem to be, as, as uh, Rachel Hamilton says, a, a degree of intransigent on something that there really shouldn't cause any, any problems. Minister, would you like to respond? Uh, I will respond by saying that uh, I have listened very carefully to the, to the points that have been made. Uh, I am happy to stick with the 2030 date, and I am also happy to recommit to having that ongoing engagement We'll get some clarity into what the delivery looks like in response to the point from Ariane Burgess. Um, but I would urge the committee to please pass this SSI to date and allow us to go on with the work of delivering the programmes. Thank you. Is the committee uh, content to recommend approval of this instrument? Uh, we are not content, uh, so there will be a vote. All those who support uh, the motion, please raise your hand. Those opposing the motion, please raise your hand. Those abstaining. So we have we have five in agreement. No. Uh, disagreement and two abstentions, so the instrument is therefore approved. Finally, can I ask the, the committee if they are content to delegate authority to me to sign off our report on this instrument? Yes. We are. Thank you. That completes our consideration of the instrument, and I would like to thank the Minister for joining us this morning. Uh,
and that completes consideration of the instrument and also the agenda items for this meeting. I wish everybody a good recess and I now close this meeting. <laughs>